president choosing his post-State of the Union battles, putting him and the Democrats on one side, Republicans and the banks and big business on the other. If you're wondering who that guy was who gave the Republican rebuttal to the State of the Union last night and why Republicans picked someone to do that who's only been in office 11 days, we will call upon the estimable explanatory power of the game show in order to figure that one out. I hope this works. Uh, plus, how the fake anti-acorn pimp guy uh, turned alleged phone fiddler may have tweeted himself into some more trouble with the law. Jonathan Turley is here. And as Keith said, oh my, Tracy Ullman is here as herself. I can't wait. That's all coming up. But we begin tonight with an ancient political science blessing. May you have enemies who are truly and demonstrably villainous. Politics 101 is picking an enemy who will resonate with the majority of people you're trying to reach. Essentially, picking a bad guy. In picking your bad guy, it's important to find someone who A, deserves it, and B, seems like they deserve it. Someone for whom it is hard to have sympathy. Well, today, the day after the State of the Union, it's clear that President Obama has picked his bad guy. Our most urgent... Have to stabilize the banking sector particularly since they helped create this mess. But, but we also need some rules of the road for Wall Street so that reckless decisions made by a few don't take our economy over the side. That's common sense. There's nothing radical about that. Big business, Wall Street, the fat cats who are doing great while most Americans are struggling. That's the enemy that Mr. Obama has chosen. Not only is Wall Street not hurting, they're doling out record pay this year, they are a big part of why everyone else is hurting in terms of the financial meltdown. During last night's State of the Union, it took President Obama 32 minutes to get to the issue of health reform. Part of the reason it took so long to get to health reform is because he spent so much time before it battering the banks. Our most urgent task upon taking office was to shore up the same banks that helped cause this crisis. It was not easy to do. And if there's one thing that has unified Democrats and Republicans and everybody in between, it's that we all hated the bank bailout. I hated it. I hated it. You hated it. It was about as popular as a root canal. One is blessed in politics to have a clear, villainous political enemy who actually deserves it. Now, one is doubly blessed if one's political opponents choose to side with that enemy. Check this out. We've recovered most of the money we spent on the banks. See that? Just a few stray Republican claps. Give Republicans the benefit of the doubt, though. Maybe they were just daydreaming during this part of the speech. Keep rolling the tape here. Most, but not all. To recover the rest, I've proposed a fee on the biggest banks. Now... Now, I know Wall Street isn't keen on this idea. But if these firms can afford to hand out big bonuses again, they can afford a modest fee to pay back the taxpayers who rescued them in their time of need. The Democratic side erupts with applause, and Republicans glued to their seats wide-eyed. Remember, the Democratic majority is so big that the Dems cross over the aisle. So here are the Democrats, and here are the Republicans. Okay, go. John Boehner, Eric Cantor, House Republican leaders, here you are, on tape, forever. Leave the banks alone. Leave Britney alone. Please. Politics 101 is picking a good enemy. Politics 201 is picking a good enemy who your political opponent sides with in public. 
And that is what President Obama appears to have done here. Everybody thinks that Republicans are on the offense right now, right? Democrats on the defense. But Republicans have a big political vulnerability on this issue for 2010, not just with the, the liberals and the independents and the moderates who the president was clearly trying to appeal to last night, but also potentially to the angry populist crowds that the Republicans want to think of as their new base, the Tea Partiers, the so-called angry independents. They're supposedly an individual freedom, power of the little guy, populist movement. How are they going to feel about the Republican position against banks paying back the taxpayers for the bailout money. These firms can afford to hand out big bonuses again. They can afford a modest fee to pay back the taxpayers who rescued them in their time of need. And the Republicans stay seated. If the Tea Party folks really are independent and really aren't just supporting Republicans, this is going to be tough politics for the Republicans. Not only against the liberals and the moderates, but against the people who they want to be their new base. President Obama also last night got a huge assist on this subject from a surprising quarter. As Mr. Obama described last week's Supreme Court ruling allowing corporations the world over to spend limitlessly on American politicians and political campaigns, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito shook his head and muttered, not true. It's rare in politics that a Supreme Court justice and a president get to square off like this. But the politics could not be more perfect for Obama here. You might recall the grounds on which then-Senator Obama voted against confirming Justice Alito. When you look at his record, when it comes to his understanding of the Constitution, I found that in almost every case, he consistently sides on behalf of the powerful against the powerless, on behalf of a strong government or corporation against upholding Americans' individual rights. Ding, 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 ding. The radical decision by the Supreme Court last week, siding with corporations over Americans' individual rights, right? Giving corporations, even foreign corporations, essentially limitless power over our politics. That decision, which Republicans are still applauding, is right in Democrats' political wheelhouse. And Democrats made clear today that they would love to have this fight. They would love to have this fight as long and as loudly as possible, please. I think it's outrageous decision. And what he really said was, not outrageous in they, that, in fact, these guys are bad guys, outrageous in terms of the way in which to read the Constitution and what constitutes free speech. And so what the president said was to the Congress, we've got to fix this. In addition to the White House, Senate Democrats today also recognize that this is exactly where they want to be in terms of a political fight. I cannot remember a time in my 36 years here in the Senate when I've come on this floor to criticize even decisions I disagree with. But this one I am, because it goes to the very core of our democracy. The conservative activist bloc on the Supreme Court reached an unnecessary and improper decision that's going to distort future elections. They've run roughshod over a long line of long-standing court precedent. Mr. President, this is a threat to the rule of law. The top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, Senator Pat Leahy of Vermont. Senator Leahy also calling out Justice Alito by name today when he raised the possibility that Justice Alito might have lied under oath when he said during his confirmation hearings that he wouldn't make radical rulings like what Senator Leahy says this decision is. Politics is about saying what you're for. Politics is also about saying what you're against. And having unpopular, powerful interests to fight against is the kind of thing that gives politicians and political parties meaning. It gives them their sense of purpose. Right now, Democrats seem to be on the verge of getting their mojo back by singling out big business and the banks as their target. Republicans, at least for now, handing them a huge assist by lining up alongside public enemy number one.